What is life? What is death? What am I doing here? Who am I without I sat up in bed and I realized in that instant of sitting up in bed and breathing, I went, Ugh! like this breathing in there, I realized I hadn't been breathing the whole time that um, I would have been in this experience. And I made that sound so loudly, it woke Tony up and he sat up and said, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I said, I don't know, but my life will never be the same again. It got bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter until it was filling in every direction and it was made up of lights and flames and white and just got closer and closer and then all of a sudden it hit me. And but suddenly there was like this kind of like this portal just opened that there I could just sense that I have access to all the information in the universe. So I had like this very deep connection with my team, offered up this prayer, and within like two months, my entire life fell apart. So, <laughs> you know, spirit doesn't mess around. <laughs> when you ask, it is always given. Then in that dream, I understood that I am, what I am is mirrored throughout the whole cosmos, that it's part of, I'm part of all of that. I am uh, literally part of everything in the cosmos and all of that is part of me. It can be seen by me through these, these mirrors. And so I felt like this web of life, you cannot unplug from it. You cannot get out of it. No matter what you do, you are in it and it is glorious. And all of that energy and potential and creativity and possibility is ours. And that we, all of the universe is reflected in our very being, in our very selves. And everything that we are is reflected throughout the whole universe too. There is no separateness. There is no such thing as anything being separate. In 2020, what a ride. My life is a hundred thousand times better than I ever imagined it could be. I am a transformation coach, um, an author, an artist, and uh, an educator. And I've been speaking about spiritual awakening and the importance of realizing who I am and who we are um, for about 20 years now. And what really started that whole journey was having a really radical spiritual awakening myself in 1989. So in order to really um, kind of create the context, let me speak a little bit before I go into the spiritual awakening about what happened prior to that. Um, and essentially what happened is since birth, I felt a discontent for the things of the world. I couldn't specifically say what it was that I was looking for, but I knew I was looking for something or someone who could show me the truth. And, you know, I couldn't even necessarily put into words what I thought the truth might be. But it, it was there, it was kind of an undercurrent that ran through everything in my life. Um, now, in addition to that, I used to have really dramatic out-of-body experiences, uh, lucid dream experiences with angels and with departed loved ones. Uh, I was really very sensitive and, you know, had psychic abilities and all of those things which would happen 
very frequently. And I remember that when I was around 14 or 15 years of age, I remember looking up to the sky and saying, I can't deal with this. You have to take it away. And what I was referring to was taking away these gifts because it felt overwhelming and I didn't know what to do with them. So those gifts closed down. Then fast forward to when I was in my 30s, my husband and I moved to Nassau in the Bahamas when, uh, yeah, 1980, around that. And, you know, like everybody else's fantasy of what the Bahamas would be like, you know, tropical paradise and, you know, it'd be amazing and it would change my life and all of those things. And all of that is true. The Bahamas is beautiful. The ocean is amazing. The colors and the vibrancy of the islands, you know, is indescribable. Um, you know, we had a boat. We used to go boating and skiing and snorkeling and doing all kinds of fun things. And, you know, we were members of all these different groups and there was a very strong sort of social vibrancy on the island. But still, there was this feeling in me underneath everything that this really wasn't it. And I remember I would go to parties and events where I would look into the eyes of the person that I was meeting a new person. Um, and I'd be looking for some recognition that they had what I was searching for. And what would happen is I'd come home feeling, you know, really disappointed because I wouldn't ever find anybody that, you know, could reflect that. Then what happened is um, I started to have a back problem that got worse and worse and worse to the point that I was on bed rest for I think around seven or eight weeks, maybe even longer. And I was in agony. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't, I could hardly dress myself. I was, I think I went to see six or seven doctors and they would prod me and, you know, check me over and give me painkillers. And it just wouldn't take the pain away. The pain, pain was unrelenting. Then I had a CAT scan and I was told that I had two bulging discs in my back. And I got to the point where the pain was just so bad. I just wanted to, you know, my life to be over because I couldn't see any way out of it. And I had this epiphany and the epiphany was, well, you know, I've tried everything else. Let me try um, praying and just kind of bargaining with God. And the bargain with God was, you know, if you can heal me, if you can take this pain away, I promise I'll be a good girl and I'll go to church. <laughs> and, you know, I hadn't been to church, I think since I was 14, because I'd been, I was so disillusioned really with the Catholic church and the way they used to teach, because I'd had these experiences with Jesus and with angels. And what I was being presented with in church and what I was hearing from the mouths of the priests didn't match up to what my direct experience had been. So I stopped going to church. So anyway, I promise, you know, I'll go to church and I'll start, you know, praying and doing all those things. Then what happened is somebody came by to help do a little massage work with me and she brought a book and it was a book on meditation. And I thought, you know, I've always wanted to meditate. So, you know, I'll add that into the bargain as well. If I start to get well, you know, I'll go to church and I'll meditate. So what happened is literally, I mean, it was like a miracle because somebody knocked on the door and said she would come and she'd heard about me. She heard I was in pain from a friend and she would do Reiki treatments on me. So she did. We did an exchange, I gave her a painting, she did Reiki treatments, a few of those, and little, little by little I started to feel better. So, <clears throat> you know, and it wasn't like overnight, but it was gradual that it got me back on my feet, I was able to function, I was able to go to work, and in my mind that was a miracle. So then what happened is I went, started going to church, you know, a few times, which I enjoyed, it was the Unity Church, non-denominational 
uh, it's very nice. Um, and then I decided, okay, I'm going to go and learn how to meditate. So I found out about a local meditation center that was literally less than half a mile from where I lived. And so I turned up, you know, and the people there were very nice. They, you know, just went through a few sort of procedures in terms of how to sit and how to hold my hands. And they told me to repeat the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, which means I, Om is the primordial sound. Namah means I bow to. And Shivaya is supreme consciousness. So I was essentially saying, I bow to the light within me, or I bow to supreme consciousness within me. So I went, I think, three or four times, but you know, it felt like a disaster because I really couldn't sit still for more than five minutes. You know, so I'd sit there and look around the room and you know, I would, I would just get really uncomfortable and I just couldn't, I just couldn't meditate. So what I did instead was I opened my eyes after five minutes or so and started looking around the room and looking at everybody's face. Just, and I think, oh, look, you know, Jeff looks really still. He must be meditating. And oh, look what this one is doing. Look what that one's doing. <laughs> so I wasn't meditating at all. But because I love the people, you know, and after we'd had these meditation, mine was a non-meditation, but they meditated practice, we would have tea and cookies. And I would chat to them and they were professional. They weren't like kooky or weird people. And that meant a lot to me. So, you know, I made connections with them. It was very nice. But I remember after the third, third or fourth time of me non-meditating, I drove home and I said, okay, I remember saying to myself as I was driving, okay, that's it. I've tried meditation. It does not work for me. It's great for other people. They're really nice, but I'm not going back. So, and I promised myself that was it. So that night I went to bed and you know, I've been a lucid dreamer for many, many years. And a lucid dream is when you have this flash of recognition in a dream and you realize or you say to yourself this is a dream and i am dreaming so this happened i had this flash of recognition and i found myself walking up a hill with a group of other people there's like maybe 15 of us or something like that i had a a yoga mat rolled under my arm and I was walking along with this lady whose name was Cheryl Lamb and she was one of the ladies that I'd met at the meditation in the meditation group She's a very nice lady she was walking along with me we were going to this very simple kind of cinder block building on the top of the hill it felt like we were in India, but you know what? I didn't know because I'd never been to India, but it just felt like it had that energy. So we went into this room and the minute I walked in the back door, I followed Cheryl in and I walked in the back door. There was a wooden platform at the back of the hall and sitting on the platform was this yogi. He was completely naked except for a white loincloth. He had a massive stomach. And he was sitting with his eyes closed and he looked in my mind he looked like a big buddha the thing is is the moment i saw him i immediately recognized that this was the being that i had been looking for my entire life i knew he was god realized there was no question it was like everything fell away as soon as i saw him and cheryl said you know in invited me into the room she told me lay your yoga mat down she said lie down on the floor so I did then she said close your eyes and repeat the mantra Om Namah Shivaya so I did what she told me I lay down closed my eyes we started repeating Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya and after I think the first or second recitation in my mind I felt a distinct tap on the top of the head 
and I knew that the yogi sitting at the front, you know, on the on the platform, had tapped somehow. He tapped the top of my head with his energy, and then my whole body started to fill with the most incredible, vibrant energy that I've ever felt in my life. It was like being plugged into ten thousand volts or something. And I could feel it going from the top of my head down through my entire body. And Cheryl said, focus on the mantra, focus on the mantra, because it was such an intense experience. You know, I, I, she was probably thinking I might come out of it or something, but so I really focused on the mantra, stayed with it, even though the, it felt like there was burning happening. My whole body, every cell was burning with this energy. And then I started to um, rise up, levitate off the floor. And then it got to the point where I was literally smelling burning. And it felt like my entire subtle body would burst into flame. And then I knew I couldn't hold it anymore. And I c continued repeating the mantra. And then at a certain point, my body just fell and crashed through time and space. And then I landed inside my physical body. I came in through the heart space and then I sat up in bed and I realized in that instant of sitting up in bed and breathing, I went Ugh! like this breathing in there. I realized I hadn't been breathing the whole time that um, I would had been in this experience. And I made that sound so loudly, it woke Tony up. And he sat up and said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I said, I don't know, but my life will never be the same again. And those words proved to be prophetic. But, you know, in that instant, I really did not know what was happening. I didn't have any sort of reference point for any of that. What happened as well is I, I had s still so much energy in me. There's no way I could go back to sleep. So I got up, Tony went, you know, back to sleep. I went into the lounge and I, the only thing I could do with the energy was to start cleaning. So I was mopping and cleaning and, you know, throwing things out and just think like this crazy person going really manic it was manic this energy is the only way I could put it and I kept doing that all night long until the place was really spick and span and then I got showered and started driving to work now the thing that happened is the drive to work is that it was only like three miles away it wasn't that far but that there was a lot of traffic. So, you know, you could sit in traffic for 40, 45 minutes just to get to work. And what would happen is I'd be filled, one second I'd be filled with the most incredible bliss and my heart was like, like, uh, like no, crazy and just ecstatic. And then the next minute it, I would just crash down and I remember pulling over and just sobbing my heart out. And I didn't know why or what that was all about. And then I'd start to feel amazing again. <laughs> so I'd start driving off again. <laughs> so what happened was, you know, I got to work and my day, you know, I was teaching art full time. It was a crazy schedule I had. And I got to the art room, opened the door and my first class for the day, Ran, they used to run to come to the art lessons. They loved it. And, um, you know, they would line up outside the door. And this particular day, there was this, you know, jolly young man standing there. And he, his name was Cancino. And he arrived, stood in line. He said, good morning, Miss Hoyle. How are you doing? And then he looked down at my shoes and he said, man, Miss Hoyle, you need a new pair of shoes. Those shoes look really bad, man. He says, I tell you straight, they look bad. <laughs> so I said, Cancino, honestly, you're so right. I do desperately need a new pair of shoes, but you know, I've been so busy, I haven't had time. But I'm gonna, I'll, I'll look at the weekend. 
anyway, break time came along and my neighbor, my friend who used to be the other art teacher, shouted out through her window, hey, hey, Julie, there's a shoe sale on at Mike's shoe store. Did you know? <laughs> you should go. <laughs> so I said, no, I didn't know. Oh my gosh, okay. I said, wow, that's message number two. I said, I'll, I'll try and make some time sometime today or tomorrow. And I thought, I'm way too busy, I can't go. So, so then at lunchtime, there's Edna again. She shouts through the window, hey, Hoyle, have you been to the shoe store yet? <laughs> so, so, so I thought, oh my God, this is message number three. So I decide, okay, I've got a bit of time. Let me hop in my car. I'm going to drive to Mike's shoe store and see what they have. So I get to Mike's shoe store. I go and sit was in the warehouse, you know, and there were boxes everywhere and it was chaos and there were people fighting over, you know, the shoes. And I just looked and thought, oh, there's no way I can deal with this. So I decided to, I just thought, you know, maybe I'm not hearing it right. Let me just go back. So I started to walk towards my car and then I realized, oh, Unity um, Church is literally just across the road and they have a really nice bookstore. Let me go inside and see if there's a book that explained what happened to me last night. So I walked into the bookstore, you know, looked around, there wasn't really anything. And then I felt a tap on my back and I turned around and there was Cheryl, the lady from the night before. So it's like, oh my God, Cheryl, oh my God, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. Guess what, I had a dream about you last night. <laughs> so she said, she pulls me and she's like, tell me, tell me. So I kind of gave her a brief description about what happens and she said to me, that is amazing, come to my house after school this afternoon and I'll explain everything to you. So later that afternoon, I went to Cheryl's. She sat me down. She said, just a minute. She went into her library and she came back with a book. She had to be the book. And the book was called Play of Consciousness and it was by Swami Muktananda. And when I opened the cover of the book, there was a picture of the yogi who had given me initiation the night before. So I said, oh my God, this is the, this is the being who was in my dream. And she said, she was fanning herself and saying, oh my God, oh my God, this is amazing. This is Nityananda, and Nityananda is the grandfather, if you like, of the yogic path. And he was a born Avadut. So I was like, a, a what? What is that? What's an Avadut? <laughs> and she said, uh, it's a God realized being. It's a being that comes into an incarnation already fully realized. And he is the one who'd given me initiation. And he had taken Mahasamadhi, or he left his body in the 1960s, I think, it was 1964 or 65, you know, when I was, you know, barely born, I was a few years old. And, um, you know, I'd lived in India his whole life. So I had been given this, she said, this is Shaktipat, this is incredible. This is a gift of grace. And it's really important that you honor what you've been given. You know, and actually there was no question of me honoring what I've been given because even in that short space of less than 24 hours, my whole life had been kind of flipped upside down and I was feeling this incredible energy and feeling joy and very connected in, extremely intuitive. I knew exactly what people were feeling and what was happening, you know. Um, and then of course that continued and what happened is, um, I started to have this very kind of unusual psychic phenomenon was ha would start to happen. Like light bulbs would go really bright and they'd burst. And then we had a phase where fans 
you know we you know the fat this the floor fans that you'd ha you have to plug them into the wall to get them to work right and many times they would spin and they weren't even plugged in the wall and the thing is is that tony my husband you know witnessed all of that and not that i would think i'm going crazy but sometimes i would question you know was i imagining it was it a dream was it real but he was there he witnessed all of it and he was like sometimes his eyes would go <laughs> so he was watching this stuff happening so there was all of those things that started to happen and then in addition to that i started to have dream darshans and darshan means to have the company of to have the sight of a saint or a siddha or a, sa or a sage and they would come into dreams to give more initiations and more teachings and those happened consistently and regularly and it wasn't just saints from the yogic tradition it was also great beings from the buddhist tradition like his holiness the dalai lama it came many times even though i never studied anything to do with buddhism ever and then sufi masters would come i would have initiations and teachings with native american shamans i would have uh, initiations also from christian mystics and oftentimes i wouldn't even know who they were it wasn't until after the dream when i did the research that i would discover the name of the great being who had um, you know come and visited and given me initiation so all of that really exploded um, and you know essentially what i realized was happening was all the gifts i'd closed down when i was 14 i had come alive again and i really believe that part of the reason i'd had such terrible back problems was because of my own you know containment and constrainment and closing down those gifts and through nityananda these gifts erupted and really expanded exponentially and then i was gifted with the most incredible experiences that you know continue actually to this day and it's really all a result of that one tap on the head from this great being bhagavan nityananda and, and what I realized as well in the course of doing a little bit of research afterwards is what Nityananda had gifted me, gifted me with is called um, Shaktipat, which is the awakening of the Kundalini. And, and Shakti is energy and Pat is the, it's the descent or the tap or the hit of grace. So it's the awakening of the Shakti or the awakening of the Kundalini. Um, and that is what um, Nichinanda had gifted me with. So I feel incredibly, incredibly fortunate. You know, I was raised a Catholic. I didn't know anything about, you know, any of these things. Although having said that, when I was 14, I did start, you know, I had this drive, this desire to learn how to do Hatha Yoga. And I went and bought a book and did a few practices and things like that so i did have that level of interest but i didn't really understand any of the teachings behind what all of that meant and i had no basis for any sort of understanding so it, it really was an incredible gift of grace that i'm really grateful for You know, and I, all I can do is speak from my own direct experience. And my answer to that would be yes, for sure. Because, I, you know, and I can give you three direct um, examples, brief examples. I think about um, maybe a month after I received Shaktipat, I was, you know, at home as, asleep, you know, and I woke up and you know that state between waking and sleeping that, that scientists call the hypnagogic state. I was in that place where I actually thought I was awake. And um, I was obviously still asleep. I was lying on my side, on my right side. And I felt this incredibly powerful and tremendous force entering the bedroom. 
and for a split second I, I was a little little afraid so I started to repeat the Lord's Prayer and I said if you are of God you are welcome if you are not of God leave now and this force came closer and then I recognized and I realized that the force of this this being it was it was Nichinanda and he came and he just leaned forward and he tapped my elbow my left elbow and again I could feel this force this great power this electrical energy just pouring into me it ran all the way down to, the, to, to my fingertips and then it came back up and then it started to circulate and ran through my entire body again I felt like I'd been plugged into some you know humongous field of energy that was beyond anything I'd ever felt before and I could literally feel every cell vibrating you know even as far into the RNA DNA you know whatever you want to call you know into the to very depth of the cell every single cell I could feel everything vibrating and then in my subtle body and then it kind of went out so I stayed with that repeating the mantra. I knew I had to repeat the mantra and I did that and then I felt Nichinanda kind of leaving and then I felt myself waking up and in my physical in the waking physical state I could still feel it was like my arm was was on fire is the only way to put it with this energy it was incredible and i had to lie there for some time for it to kind of like calm down a bit and then i decided you know i had all this energy i needed to go walk so i went for like a power walk and then i came back and did like 10 i don't know what i was doing on all day i was like doing all these chores and cleaning and doing crazy stuff and the feeling that I had in my arm lasted for days. It, it was at least five, maybe six days, enough for the energy to be able to sort of dissipate and integrate into my body. And again, what happened is a successive expansion of awareness happened in keeping with what had been poured into me. So that was another you know, initiation. Here's another example, and I'm not sure when this was, I think it was probably in the maybe mid 90s, something like that. But I would have these dreams where I would wake to lucidity. I'd remember, oh, this is a dream and I'm dreaming. And then I would see a great saint standing in front of me or walking towards me. And oftentimes I didn't know who they were, but I recognized the energy of the being. And I would just get down on my knees and I would pranam, I'd put my head on the floor, or I would do this and bow. So this happened in this particular dream. I was I awoke to lucidity. I was walking along a dusty road. It's seemingly in the middle of nowhere in India. And I saw this great being walking towards me. He was dressed very simply. He had a bald head and he had glasses on. And I just pronounced, put my hands together. I went down to the floor, put my head on the floor. And then he came towards me and he tapped my shoulder and he had me stand up. And, you know, I bowed again to him. And he said, I can give initiation. Would you like? And I said, oh, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. So he took his thumb and he leaned forward and he pressed his thumb right here between my eyes and the third eye. And again, I felt the most amazing energy pouring through me. I was full, filled with bliss. And then after a few seconds, he pulled his thumb away and I you know, bowed to him and I asked him his name. I said to him, my name's Julie please, you know, can you tell me your name? Thank you so much. And he said, um, uh, Swami Ram Turpa. Swami Ram Turpa. And I was thinking, Swami Ram Turpa, I don't, I, you know, I just thank you very much. And then um, I came back 
you know, <clears throat> woke up and later I did research and I found out that in, indeed he was a great saint. He's revered in India and he was also a scholar and he was well known for his mathematical studies and he was revered and, you know, I'd never heard of him before that point. And again, the energy of that took time to settle when I first, you know, woke up and came out of it. I had to, you know, let everything kind of like settle a while before I could get out and start moving because my energy field just felt so expanded and I, I wasn't quite in my body somehow and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't kind of think. My mind wasn't functioning in that way. So that's, you know, another example. And, you know, I have examples from Lord Jesus. Jesus came in, uh, in a few, three or four dreams to give initiation. You know, and it was really beautiful. And then um, there are initiations from Native American shamans. And one I would like, I feel really led to share today because I think it speaks to what's happening on the planet now. And this is from a Native American shaman that gave this initiation. And, and in this particular dream, what happened is I woke to lucidity and I found myself in like a wooded area that was remote and it was a sacred space. And I was with um, Hopi Indians and the chief or the leader of this group handed me a book and there were about I think five or six of them and you know the chief and the main shaman gave me a book and asked me to look through it so I started to look through the book and there were all these images of all these amazing great beings saints and siddhas and masters and seers and you know male and female from the Tibetan path and the yogic tradition and you know every tradition and I look kept looking through it and looking through it and I knew every single one of them because I'd met them in dreams in lucid dreams and I knew them and I was just in ecstasy looking through this book and then the shaman said to me, choose your gifts. And as I got further to the back of the book, there were a list of gifts and I knew that I could choose two. So there were things like, you know, clairaudience, clairvoyance, and, you know, these, a list of all these gifts. And I didn't even really read what they were, I just knew intuitively what I was meant to ask for. So I said, I choose the gifts <clears throat> of healing and prophecy. So the, the shaman, shaman <clears throat> said to me, be very careful with the second gift. It is dangerous. And I said, yes, I know. I will use it only in accordance with the great beings who have given me initiation. And after I said that, he bowed and I knew that I'd passed the test. So then he led me away with all the other, you know, the other Indian, Native American Indians. They took me to a clearing, a very small clearing. They laid me down on the ground. And then they had these four wooden posts on the ground and they tied each of my wrists to the posts and then my feet to the other two posts. So I was literally stretched out. <clears throat> and then they all started drumming and beating and burning incense and wood and chanting and, you know, making all these statements and dancing around me. And then the chief, he took these rattles and he was rattling and then he started rattling and, and dancing around my body. 
then he started stepping, he stepped onto my chest and he was stamping his feet on my chest really, really heavily. It really hurt because I could, it was like, you know, in the lucid dream, you feel everything a lot more acutely. So it really hurt. And then he finally stamped with his right foot and he cracked my ribs. My ribs cracked open and then he pushed his right foot into the cavity of my chest. And with his foot, he took his foot and he started squeezing my heart. And then he turned at my heart. And as he turned the heart, he said, this is the turning of the heart in accordance with the blue star Hopi prophecy. Then he came off, came off my chest and then I felt all this energy entering my being. It was just incredible. And then it was like my, my heart came back to sort of normal, my cl chest closed. And then I came back to the body and I woke up and again, I couldn't move and for a long, 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 long time. Now here's the thing. I never studied anything to do with Native American shamanism or, you know, teachings or anything. I never even heard of the Blue Star Prophecy. I didn't have a clue what that was at all. Um, so, and I couldn't find a whole lot, you know, back then. I'm not even sure I was online back in the 90s. I don't think I was. And it was only until fairly recently that I began to understand that the blue star prophecy is about, you know, the, the, the moving into the next dimension. It's the ninth, apparently the blue star is the ninth and final sign before this transitioning into this new world, into the fifth world. So I'm, I'm, I have been feeling very strongly lately that this initiation links very directly with what has been happening in the world now. And my intuition is that many of us have been uh, trained, initiated, guided, directed, if you like, for many, many years leading up to what is happening today. You know, and I'm not certainly not a scholar, and I really don't know the full story of what this means with respect to the Blue Star Prophecy, but I know it has significant meaning with respect to, I think, what we're going through now, because part of the prophecy is about the ending times, you know, the, the, the way the world ending, the old way ending, and the new world coming into manifestation. You know, and I've thought about that a lot lately, and I think that's what that was pointing to, about, you know, and even in the sharing of this, you know, I shared it, I, I shared some of it in, in the book that I wrote, but, um, you know, I haven't sort of come out and publicly shared this until this moment. So, the answer to that question, you know, do initiations continue is yes, they certainly do. And they have very much continued for me. I, I couldn't even put a number on how many initiations I've been given over the last, I don't know how many years, because there's been a lot and it always changes my state afterwards. There's always an expansion. There's always movement out and there's always a significant change, you know, emotionally, mentally, in, in, every, in every way possible. You, you know, I'm, I'm the one experiencing all of this and it still blows my mind. You know, it's like, how did that happen? You know, I'm from a working class family, Catholic upbringing, you know, there was no, 
my mother was an atheist. We never went to church, really. You know, there's all of that. And yet, <laughs> all of this, um, which, as I said, continues. You know, and wh what I've shared is just a little of what has been given because there's also the initiations from Lord Jesus and from, you know, other shamans and, you know, the ayahuasca shamans. I've never even heard of ayahuasca. I didn't know what that was. I had to do research and then find out, oh, you know, it's a herb or a medicine that, you know, shamans take to have altered states. So, so you know, what, what I think has been happening in my case is that I've been given all these teachings and initiations from all these beings from different paths and traditions so that I could meet whoever I meet and speak the language of that tradition and be able to meet that person wherever he or she is in a way that has authenticity and integrity because there's some understanding because of what I've been given. I mean, I don't pretend to be a scholar of Tibetan Buddhism, for example, but I've had the direct darshan and direct experience and direct initiations from His Holiness and also from Tibetan deities. And so it just, it, there's a commonality there somehow, I think, that people recognize, even if I don't necessarily speak specifically about a, a certain experience. There's, there's a there's a resonance that is there prior to having any conversation. Um, you know, and I think this is what we're all being called to, to step forward and speak our truth from that place of direct experience um, and to meet people where, wherever they are on their journey and on their path. Yes, you know, I, I certainly it's easier for people who have some sort of kind of spiritual life and practice that they can connect into. If all you have is the television, you know, and distractions, it's much, much, much more difficult. But the thing that I know is true is that supreme intelligence the Supreme Self, the Absolute God, whatever you want to call it, is extremely intelligent. And it will find a way to grab somebody's attention, even if that person has to get on their knees and be broken, which has happened to all of us at certain periods in our lives. It's not until we really, you know, almost collapse and give up, oftentimes that we begin to see clearly and see differently and we're open enough to be able to receive. And I know that that is unfailing in its effect. And I trust that more than, you know, the stories and the anxiety and the fear that's kind of floating around the planet right now. Um, you know, and even that has its place because I think too, you know, when people get sick and tired of being anxious and fearful and, you know, scared to death about whatever the story is, whether it's worrying about their job or worrying about their family or their own health or whatever, 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 you know, there comes a point where you can only keep kind of running in that groove, you know, for a certain amount of time. Then there's a natural tendency to want to find a way out or want to find a solution or a resolution or to pray. You know, and like, you know, that saying about, you know, there are no atheists in the trenches, you know, with the guys that were, you know, in the war and all of that. You know, that is really true. And I know for all of us at some point that have reached out and prayed, like I reached out and prayed when I was at my lowest with my back pain. That's the, that's the gift. That's the capacity that we all have to be able to come to this awareness. Well, I've tried everything else. Let me try God if there is such a thing, you know? And, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure that's what people will do. That's what people are doing. Because I know that, you know, people that I would never have expected to kind of reach out to me have been reaching out to me. 
both in the waking state and the dream state, I may add. Um, and so I think a lot of what is happening is really about causing people to be still enough to have some kind of awakening. And again, that is what happened in my case because I was running myself ragged because I was, you know, I was trying to find something that, you know, I didn't know where to go looking for it. So I'd be working all day long and then I go to the gym for two or three hours and then I'd be doing painting. So like from six, seven in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, I had all these activities to, until I had the back problem. And then I couldn't do anything other than lie on my bed and look at the ceiling. So that was the most effective way to get my attention. And that is what is happening, I'm absolutely certain, in the world today. It's making everybody stop and start to pay attention to what has value, what is most valuable, what is most important. You know, do any of these concerns about, you know, accumulation or getting the best car or whatever whatever the story is does that have value and i think a lot of people are waking up to the realization that of the stories they've been sold about accumulation don't have any merit um so you know i really do believe that the, there is a mass awakening happening and in their own way people are coming to realize what has value in their lives and they're coming to discover as well that which never changes that which never comes and goes that which is always here you know everything else changes the body changes you, we change our minds our emotions change everything and to discover that which never changes and is constant and is always here is the key to freedom and people have the opportunity now to be able to explore what does that mean for them without the trappings of religiosity or any isms, you know? Yeah. You know, what is in essence the most valuable thing? What is here right now? When you take your name away, you know, your idea of who you are, your job, your role in life, you know, all of those things, when that all goes, what remains? Is there something that is still here? And um, that is what people are waking up to and discovering, you know, in their own way and in their own time as well. And I really don't, I know there's a lot of talk we're hearing about getting back to normal, getting back to normal, when we get back to normal. I don't think we'll ever get back to normal because I don't think it was normal in the beginning anyway. Everybody that I know is exhausted and feeling, you know, depleted and everything. I think this will be a very new way of operating and being um, in the world, despite what we're being sold. The one, the one quote I really do love, and it's been my standby for years, is uh, a quote from Bhagavan Nityananda, which is extremely simple but very potent. And he says, or he said, the heart is the hub of all sacred places. Go there and roam. Mm. And the thing is, is that, you know, when you connect into your heart and you, you know, essentially the mind becomes still and takes rest in the heart is what happens. You can't take your mind with you and all your doubts and anxieties and be fully in your heart and be fully present in your heart and in that sacred space. And that space is the space of the self, the space of the saints, the siddhas, the great beings. You know, all of that has to drop. You know, that's why pranaming and putting your head on the floor is, 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 is so important in India because the, the idea is that you put your, your mind is lower than your heart. When you put your head on the ground, your heart is higher, right? Um, and that sort of, that act of bowing down 
is really important because it's about just you know getting out of your mind going into your heart and you know being there and trusting what you're feeling and trusting your intuitions and valuing what you're being given there as opposed to you know the craziness that goes on up here so it's really all about being in the heart center the heart is the hub of all sacred places go there and roam Thank you.